Welcome to another one of our Sunday afternoon talks. This one is going to be on Ayurveda by Dr. Bhatta Sharati. Now he came to the festival in 2019 and gave, can you see our little white dog in the background? Okay. He came to the festival in 2019 and uh, gave nine hours of talks and uh, just an incredible person. He's uh, qualified at the very highest level. In fact, then went on to organize teaching courses himself. Together with his good wife, Sharanya, who I have to say is the one who sort of drives <laughs> my little dog is lurking away in the background, um, who who's, is um, drives the entire system and uh, she's just fabulous. And I have to say that between them, they do a brilliant job down there. So they, he has been doing this for some time. He has this small team. He'll tell you all about it. It's the most wonderful little place. And if you want, I don't know if I've still got it on my hair. If you want to know, yes, he's an adorable little dog. I'll introduce you in a moment. Um, so if you want to know what it's like to go on a course there on the chat line, I've actually put day one arrival of a blog that I wrote when we first, my Sonali and I first went there. And uh, it's on the festival website under the blog. And that's day one arrival. And I did a blog of something like uh, 10, 10 talks or 10 days or something. So have a read of that. Get an insight into what this place looks like. It's got pictures and uh, some of the treatment things and so forth. So have a look. It was really eye opening. I have to say, that they treat us surrounding much better than me. She got all the rose water and all the, the really kind treatments. And then they said, oh, for you, I'm sorry. You'll need the, you'll need the more difficult stuff. So um, I think they're partial to, to nicer people. So without much ado, let me hand you over to Dr. Partha Sharapi. He's talking all the way from Kerala. Welcome. And thank you very much for your support. I knew that last time. You came over and you left your practice for some time to come and talk to us at the festival. We're incredibly grateful for your support. And today, I know that it's a very hard time in India right now with lockdown and the entire place is um, shut down. But I hear that you're trying to open first things next month. So, um, so if you've got your video available, I'd like to hand you over to Dr. Pat um and if i can find you on video i will pin you so that the world can see there you go so welcome thank you very much for coming and all over thank you. you yeah so thank you so much for the wonderful introduction nice to see such lovely people. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yeah, wonderful. So, yes, that's it. I think he gave a beautiful introduction. Uh, even I need not say anything. Everything is being told. So I would take the freedom of directly jumping into the topic and just giving you an idea about our discussion. Uh, basically, as you all know, we are going to talk about Ayurveda and immunity. And everyone are so keen about these two things, immunity, immunity boosting, immunity building. And Ayurveda naturally is one of the best systems of medicine where this immunity aspect is well dealt with. So we are going to see those things. And of course, I will have my chat box active. And if there are any uh, pointers, I would definitely incorporate in the during the session. However, if there are any questions, I would be addressing the questions in the end. So depending upon the 
pointers that I receive in the chat box, I will either select them to discuss during the session or I will leave it for a discussion later. And if there are anything missed out, I think uh, Ramji would be directing me to answer those uh, questions or doubts. So let me share my screen. So Ayurveda in immunity, as we all know, a straightforward topic that we are going to discuss. So as we, as I just informed you, this is one of the hot topics in the recent times. The reason for this immunity and Ayurveda being one of the hot topics is that as of now, immunity is the only aspect that we can bet upon in this current pandemic situation of COVID-19. We don't have any other option. There is until this moment, we don't have any medicines available for COVID-19. And unfortunately, it is spreading really fast. And a lot of people who are who have already contracted the infection are asymptomatic. And we really don't know who is positive, who is actually positive, who is not positive, who is carrying the infection. We, we are really clueless about all these factors. So the only thing that we can bet upon is to have a good immune system or a good immune response. And Ayurveda has wonderful solutions and methodologies to make this happen. And just to give you a gist about our plan of discussion, what are we going to discuss and learn and know about in the next few minutes? We're going to understand immunity from an Ayurveda perspective because the understanding of immunity itself will give a bigger picture. Uh, it's going to be short and ways to get optimal immunity would be the main focus or the main aspect of the discussion today. And these are some disclaimers. I would like to tell you that I'm not going to give you a magical remedy that can prevent you from contracting the disease. That's not the intention of the topic the intention of this discussion and as and and as well i'm not going to give any formulations that this formulation is good to improve your immunity and this formulation is good to improve your immunity go to amazon and buy this and do like this that's not the idea the whole approach is to give you some formulas to tweak your lifestyle and the daily living that is tweak your lifestyle and daily living and with that, you can experience a transformation, a definite transformation. With, even with simple lifestyle modifications, there can be very good transformations that you can experience in your daily living, which can boost your immunity and also uh, which can help you in all this uh, current uh, COVID situation, crisis, etc. Not just for this COVID situation, but in general. And the wisdom that we are going to get in the next few minutes is completely from the ancient scriptures, directly from the scriptures, authentic, authentic source scriptures. And uh, I'm not bringing in my personal views or my, my uh, own remedies and formulations. It's all pure from the scriptures, from the Shastras. And uh, again, a disclaimer that it's not a medical advice, but I'm giving you a guidance for a healthy living. So this is what we are going to see. And when I talk about uh, formulas to tweak your lifestyle and formulas to tweak your daily living, it's not possible in this 45 minutes or one hour to give everything possible, but I'm just going to give you a taste of everything and make you, there are definitely various uh, uh, take-home information that you can start applying and practicing right from today. But it's not going to be in total. You're not going to get a, a, a complete information. We have to understand the limitation of time also. So I hope you're all with me. So you, you, did you all get what we are going to see today? What we are going to, what we are going to explore today? Can anyone confirm in the chat box? Yeah, no, that was very clear. Thank you. Yeah, yes. So immunity, basically what you see on the left, the words 
seems like you uh, the words uh, might be looking so unusual for you it, it will be all greek and latin for you but don't worry about the words they are all sanskrit terminologies i don't want to just translate these sanskrit terminologies make it so so diluted rather i've kept the terminologies but no no there is no necessity or no hard and fast rule that you should know the terminologies because i'm going to explain them even if you come across any sanskrit terminologies i'm going to explain them but if i am going to remove these terminologies it becomes so diluted and in fact there are no exact translations or alternative words that i can replace with but do not worry about the words i'm going to make it as simple as possible now we are going to see what is on our left that is ayurveda explains immunity as bala the the word meaning of bala it can be understood as immunity but the simplest meaning of it is strength ayurveda explains three types of bala or strength or immunity three types of immunity sahaja kalaja yukti krita that is we have a kind of immunity right from birth we would have seen some people having a upper hand on immunity we will be seeing some people who are always prone to some infections and things like that naturally that is their nature and we call it as sahaja sahaja by nature by default some people will have a strong immune system and some will have a weak immune system ayurveda explains that if at all you know what kapha vata pitta is for those who know it i would tell this kapha dominant people have a little upper hand on immunity they have a good immune response when compared to vata dominant people if you know what vata pitta kapha what i am meaning here as kapha dominant people good if you don't know what i am talking about very good because you will understand better without any confusions and this immunity ayurveda explains that yes we have some innate immunity but that innate immunity is modifiable or it gets modified with seasons that is season has an impact on immunity we are going to see that during the course of the discussion that there are some seasons where our immune responses are good there are some seasons where our immunity and immune responses are very bad one superficial example if i should give you at this point winter is a period where our immune response and our strength is good and suddenly after winter when we go in for spring there will be a dramatic reduction in our immune immunity that is a time where people suffer with lot of flu and infections and things like that there is a sudden transition or a sudden depletion in our immune response and the immune response goes to a worst stage during uh, summers and rainy seasons and fortunately you don't have an appreciable summer so you need not worry about it and many a times in countries like uk i believe that summer and rains always club together if such is the situation then the immune response will be very weak the immune system will be very weak so what i'm trying to convey here is season according to season our immunity has some uh some uh, modifications our immune system undergo some modifications according to the seasons we are going to see that as we go forward yukti krita is something that is achieved that is immunity is achieved by certain ways i would say it can be achieved the simplest way of achieving a good immune system is by using some remedies or medicines for example people are talking about talking big about this chavana prasha ashwagandha and things like that i am not going to talk about that now however there are certain medicines and there are certain ways in which we can improve our immune responses one of the ways in which we can we can improve our immune responses is by tweaking our lifestyle and our daily habits and our daily living which ayurveda explains as dinacharya and ritucharya daily regimen and seasonal regimen that is going to be the core of our discussion today so here with the understanding of bala ayurveda there is no 
alternative word for immunity in ayurveda but this immunity is been explained in multiple dimensions i'm giving you all these dimensions of explanation so you understand the vastness then the next uh, explanation you see baladishtanam arogyam again a sanskrit word arogyam is health baladishtanam the health is residing on this aspect of strength so the the factor that decides if a person is healthy or not is just the factor called strength or immunity the innate strength of the person or the innate immunity of the person the immunity of the person decides whether you are healthy or not whether you are healthy or diseased because when your immunity is low you are prone to all types of diseases we are going to expand this as we go forward and I, uh, there are four dimensions of this bala as explained in ayurveda deha bala datu bala agni bala manobala deha bala is the innate strength the strength of the body the strength of the physical body datu bala is the strength of the structural elements of the body agni bala is the strength of the digestive system manobala is the strength of the mind why is strength of the mind this uh included here you will understand as we go forward and uh, this is about the these two the two aspects of bala i have explained is focusing on the preventive aspects of immunity but immunity also has a curative aspect that is the the mind map that you see in red that is immunity has a role to play even when a person is diseased ayurveda explains that as vyadi utpadaka pradibandhakatvam vyadi kshamatvam and vikara vighata bhava do not worry about the terminologies to make it simple immunity is a factor from an ayurveda perspective immunity is a factor which acts as a barrier to prevent the manifestation of disease that is you are in the middle of that is a person who has who is positive covid positive is you have interacted with that person but still you have a system a barrier resistance mechanism where you don't get affected you don't get you don't contract the disease that is called a barrier mechanism that is explained in ayurveda as vyadi utpadaka pratibandhakatvam and just in case if someone has contracted the disease somehow the barrier mechanism did not work and a person has contracted the disease then there is one aspect of immunity which is a mechanism to tolerate the manifested diseases which is explained as vyadhi kshamatvam the word kshama people who are studying vedanta would have understood the word kshama is tolerating or bearing bearing with the disease so people who have this aspect of immunity well will be asymptomatic or will not suffer with the disease or suffer with the complications of the disease so that is also one aspect of immunity we see some people who are contracted the disease but say it's still they are asymptomatic because their immune response is good and a person who has contracted the disease but at one point of time he has to come out of the disease he has to break the pathology of the disease so as to escape from the trap of the disease there is one aspect of immunity that works at that level and that is called as vighar vikara vighata bhava that is a capability to break the disease pathology so if i am going to explain these factors of bala datu bala deha bala resistance vyadhik shamatvam etc halfway through you will be bored and hardly you will understand anything so i have taken a a strategy to make you understand these beautiful concepts of ayurveda in the most simplest form so that strategy is what you see on your right i am going to take these six aspects or the six key factors of immunity which is nothing but the consolidation of what you see on the left i have consolidated all these factors that you see on the left i have divided into six headings and we are going to see one by one dosha agni dhatu ojas deha and manas again they are tongue twisters and greek and latin for you 
you need not understand these terminologies. In fact, if you don't understand these terminologies, you will understand this session better. So I would give you that kind of a confidence. That doesn't mean that people who understand these terminologies will not understand the, the discussion. Maybe you have to kind of uh, be with me. Don't go forward, just be with me. I hope that was clear. Can anyone just confirm in the chat box? Was that clear? Yeah, thank you. So just going forward, we are going to see these six points one by one. These six points, what you see on the right, dosha, agni, the hatu, or just deha and manas, one by one. So those, whenever you see those six points coming up in the slide, it is marked in yellow so that you are with me, you follow the presentation. So doshas, many of you or even most of you might know that there is vata, pitta and kapha. And this is not a time where it is not necessary for me to explain what these doshas are. What are the pancha mahabhutas, the five elements, air and what air and space element making vata, fire, fire element making pitta, fire and water element making pitta and uh, etc. This explanation or making you understand the philosophy of vata, pitta, kapha is not possible in this short frame, point one. And there is no necessity for you to understand what these vata, pitta and kapha are for this discussion. Rather to make it simple, I'll just give you a kind of an imaginary, I can give you an explanation with which you can imagine with me. I'll explain in a small imaginary mode. There are three factors in the body which are named as Vata, Pitta and Kapha, just forget about the name. There are just three factors in the body. They are usually in equilibrium. Equilibrium meaning it's not a balance, but it is in equilibrium. There is a difference between balance and equilibrium. Balance meaning 33.3% of Vata, Pitta and Kappa, each 33.3. That's not the scenario. The, the proportion of Vata, Pitta and Kappa or the three factors in each individual will be different. It is different in me. It is different in you. It is different. The proportion is different in each one of us. And hence, we are all different in terms of appearance, in terms of nature, in terms of everything we are different because the proportions are different. But these proportions with which we are born with, these proportions should be always the same. This proportion should not be disturbed. If the proportion of these three factors are disturbed, which means that our doshas, our three factors are disturbed. That is the three factors are in, in equilibrium. If we lose the equilibrium of these three factors, the body is not functioning optimally. There is a possibility of one to contract a disease or contract a problem or illness or whatever it is. Your functioning will be disturbed when these three factors are not functioning optimally. I'm just rephrasing and putting it simple. There are three factors. As long as these three factors are in equilibrium, all the functioning of the body will be optimal. The physiology of the body will be optimal, meaning that we are disease free. But if these three factors gets disturbed, if there is a disturbance in the equilibrium of these three factors, our system will not function optimally, meaning we are prone to be deceased or we are already deceased. So our focus is to maintain these three factors in equilibrium. So how to maintain this equilibrium? Yes, we can see that later if possible. But how not to, to disturb them is, should be our focus. What we have to do, our responsibility now, especially in this situation of pandemic is we have to follow a diet and a lifestyle which will not disturb these doshas. If at all we follow a diet and lifestyle which will disturb or disturb the equilibrium of these doshas, we are susceptible for disease or we are susceptible for even contracting this infection because our immunity is going to be disturbed. 
so having a healthy diet and a healthy lifestyle is one of the most important things that one has to focus at this current situation and unfortunately we are all into a lot of misconceptions we are following a lot of misconceptions in the context of diet and lifestyle we are going to clarify and get a bigger picture that is the whole intention of today's discussion so as i told you optimal functioning of this of the body ensures optimal health so if we are willing to be healthy we have to have an optimal functioning of the body or optimal physiology to have an optimal physiology we have to have an equilibrium in these doshas so our whole aim is to follow a diet and lifestyle which does not disturb the equilibrium of doshas i'm going to give you some simple markers or factors which can disturb these doshas so these are just examples over exertion increases vata i'm going to talk about exercises later but just giving you a different example i'm going to take exercise as a topic but make it as a simple explanation the moment you decide one fine day you decide to go to a gym you go to a gym you exercise you cannot do much but you still push yourself because you have already been to the gym you come home and that night you are going to struggle and suffer like anything with pains all over your body maybe to an extent that some people can get some fevers and chills in the night and that over exertion disturbs vata whatever pain that you experience in your muscle body etc is because of the increase or the disturbance of vata so any exertion disturbs or increases vata so this is one example which you can understand how simply these doshas are disturbed with our day to day simple mistakes that we perform keeping awake in the night disturbs vata increases vata many a times especially with this covid scenario many people are keeping awake in the night not sleeping at right time if you lose your sleep in the night next day morning when you get up either you are little cranky your your day doesn't seem good or many a times you have your evacuation pattern disturbed when you have a disturbed night sleep that also explains the disturbance of vata dosha a simple explanation a simple understanding about an increase of the disturbance of pitta is when you take a spicy food when you take a spicy food immediately you see you sweat a lot next day morning you experience that spiciness even in your evacuation that's an ex a simple way to understand that increase of pitta with our day to day wrong activities or some wrong regimen sleeping during the day increases kapha we are going to talk about sleeping during the day in detail or sleeping in detail as we go forward but sleeping during the day there are some provisions to sleep during summers when the season is very hot which is understood as siesta in many a countries i am going to touch the topic but if you are going to sleep in winters or if you are going to sleep in spring you are prone to get some problems and rather you don't feel good instead you feel little lethargic if you sleep during the day that is because of the increase of kapha kapha dosha increases when you sleep during the day eating yogurt in the night can increase kapha and it is these are all the daily activities that can disturb doshas but at the same time these activities are season specific for example sleeping during the day in some season is good some season it is not acceptable exercising in some season is okay exercising hard in some season is required exercising hard in some season is contraindicated having heavy food in some season is still okay heavy food in some season is not accepted it creates a lot of problem dieting in one particular season can be highly detrimental and it can cause a lot of problems honey hot water etc people are following this 365 days there is no criteria as to decide when why how what etc but ayurveda beautifully explains all this and this next few minutes from now we are going to see that so i am just taking it forward what should we do to have these doshas in equilibrium the take home informations or the remedies for you starts from here 
the daily routine and seasonal routine is one of the most important things that we see in Ayurveda, which is explained as Dinacharya and Ritucharya. I have broken down this routine, Dinacharya and Ritucharya, into the six headings. So we are going to see that Dinacharya and Ritucharya daily and seasonal routine as explained in Ayurveda. The one of the most important or the prime routine or the prime regimen that one has to follow is waking up at Brahma Muhurta, that is 45 minutes before sunrise. I know it is difficult in countries like uh, UK, especially in winters, where sunrise, etc. is really difficult. But waking up with the sun and sleeping with the sunset is a, a simple practice for countries where sunrise and sunset is pretty straightforward but you have to tweak a lot in country where you are basically uh, let us assume that you are uh, like uh, you are on days where you have proper sunrise and sunset waking up at brahma muhurta that is 45 minutes before sunrise is an important criteria or having a early waking up early is you can simplify this explanation as waking up early when we talk about waking up early, sleeping early is also a part, it's also an important aspect. And when we reach sleeping, I'm going to club the concept of sleeping and waking up early together, which will make this understanding better. This is one of the important points, waking up early. Why? We are going to see that in a few minutes. So if you're not waking up early, if you're not waking up with the nature or if you're not waking up at Brahma Muhurta, the doshas gets disturbed. Exercising in moderation. Exercising in moderation. Many a times when it comes to exercise, nowadays what we see is people either overdo or people don't exercise. That is, either we see one category of people who are exercising a lot in terms of the duration or lot in terms of pushing oneself to do the exercise and doing exercise in a wrong time of the day, etc. There are a lot of mistakes that we see in the common day. I'm going to enlighten or explain that in a minute. But at the same time, we see a lot of people who are absolutely sedentary. Uh, to the extent that the modern researchers tell that sitting is a new smoking. Um, when it comes to exercise, practicing exercise every day matters. When we talk about the daily regimen, doing it on a daily basis is one of the most important things. Many a times we see people tell that they exercise two times in a week, three times in a week, four times in a week. This is not acceptable. Instead of working out or doing some exercise three times in a week for one hour, doing exercise 10 minutes a day for all seven days or 365 days would be a better option. Doing exercise half your capacity is what is explained in the Shastra. Ardha Shaktiya Nishevyastu Balibis Nikdabojibihi. There goes the verse from the Shastra. Doing half your capacity, the two Doing half your capacity, there is some specific mentioning about the season where you can do half your capacity. There are some season where you have to reduce further. For example, in seasons like summer and rainy season, don't even do half your capacity, reduce further. So do not half your capacity. What is half your capacity? If you have a capability to work out for one hour, just work out for half an hour. That is enough. Have some reserve. I'm going to talk about this reserve in a few minutes because that's a very important aspect of having some reserves. Let us have some reserve energy. Don't utilize the whole reserve energy by exercising your, the, full of your cap, the full capacity. Do half your capacity, but do it daily. Always do exercise at empty stomach. Many a times we see people take some snack like a fruit or something just before going for workouts. Never do that. So nowadays with this COVID scenario, people, uh, we always have excuses. We cannot go out of our house because we are, uh, we are susceptible, etc. 
doing 10 minutes of something to make you sweat is possible even inside our house so doing it daily is the key the which we can start doing right from today or sorry right from tomorrow and uh, there is a time time at which exercise is best uh, beneficial that is in the morning doing exercise in the evening is not advisable we are going to touch that topic also sleeping during the day and the two after food is highly disturbing nowadays people don't go to office and they take the opportunity to have their lunch heavy lunch and take a nap sleeping during the day is not advisable throughout the year it is advisable only in summers that too when the summers are very strong you have a provision to sleep during the day aged people have a provision to sleep during the day but in general sleeping during the day is not advisable and sleeping after food is highly problematic which can disturb your doshas which can when doshas are disturbed you understand the sequence when doshas are disturbed your optimum functioning of the or physiology is disturbed and you are prone for disease even you are prone for covid i'm not making you afraid but that is the reality so try your best not to disturb the doshas sleeping during the day after your food is disturbing your doshas no doubt what if you are very sleepy during the day after your food you have a provision to lie down and uh, sorry recline and sleep instead of lying down and sleeping if you have had your food food meaning the biggest meal of the day after your lunch <clears throat> I'm sorry. so preferably if you are sleepy during the day you can have a nap before your big meal or if you are really sleepy after your meal you have a provision to recline and sleep which will not disturb the doshas see how how precise or see the nuance of ayurveda you lie down and sleep the doshas are disturbed but if you are going to recline and sleep in a sitting posture the doshas are not disturbed heavy food in the night can have a heavy impact on disturbing doshas <coughs> i don't suggest to take the heavy food during the day however heavy food in the day during the day is not going to make, make a huge disturbance but the heavy food in the night is capable of doing a huge dis disturbance sleep one of the most important topics many believe that sleep is a waste of time but it is absolutely not sleep is the most important time where a lot of rest and repair activities happen uh, we all know anabolism and catabolism anabolism is conservation of energy this conservation of energy happens during the night and with the conserved energy we do our daily activities that is catabolism daily activities including our digestive process or whatever that we do during the day is because of the energy that is being conserved during the night with the sleep so a night sleep is highly important for a good conservation of energy and hence to use we can use the energy during the day for all our activities having a healthy sleeping pattern is highly essential and even modern researches prove that a good sleeping pattern is linked with health is linked with life expectancy linked with immunity your capability to fight your infection is linked with good sleeping patterns wbc the fighting the the what do you call the, the factors that are responsible for fighting mechanism fighting diseases in our body the white blood cells are working well with good sleep patterns tumor necrosis factor tnf tumor necrosis factor is linked with sleep patterns when i tell sleep patterns there is a, a big understanding in what we mean as sleep pattern because many of us now sleep 8 hours a day 9 hours a day we have a sufficient time to sleep but we are not following a good sleep pattern so what is a good sleep pattern the good sleep pattern is one is a pattern where one sleeps at an appropriate time and wakes up at an appropriate time then what is the appropriate time where one should sleep according to 
even astrology, there is a Yama called Kali Yama. Yama is a block of time. As we have hour and minute, etc., we have a block of time which is called as Yama, Kali Yama. Kali Yama is a time block between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. in the night. 10 p.m. in the night and 2 a.m. in the morning. The time between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. is called as Kali Yama, the Kali, the dark goddess. One has to, the, the, the poetic way of explaining this Kali Yama from an Ayurveda perspective is that one has to be sleeping dead, sleeping unconscious at this Kali Yama as though the Kali goddess, the dark goddess has cut off your head. If you see the modern explanation, the modern science talks about melatonin hormone, the dark hormone. The melatonin hormone is highly available in this period. Between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m., the modern researchers have come out, come up with, the, with such explanations that melatonin hormone is very uh, is highly available at this time. One has to sleep at this time. The modern researchers are also coming in tune with the explanation of Ayurveda. So nowadays, the modern people or the youngsters tell that what is the point? I get eight hours of sleep or nine hours of sleep. What is the point in in uh, uh, sleeping at an appropriate time, sleeping at an appropriate time matters. If you lose your sleep in Kali Yama, your rest and repair mechanism doesn't happen properly. Sleeping wake late and waking up late does not give the same results in terms of rest, repair, anabolism, conservation of energy. It is not going to happen. So if you are sleeping early, you are expected to wake up early that is what is the first point that we have seen. There is waking up at Brahma Muhurta before sunrise or waking up early. So sleeping early and waking up early is essential. So we gain energy during sleep. Even modern researchers have proven that growth hormones are produced in excess or produced uh, well during the period of sleeping, especially during this 10 a.m. 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Just to see how nature facilitates us to sleep during this Kali Yama or how nature facilitates or enables us to sleep early, we can understand that a factor called tamas is dominant in nature. People who don't understand what tamas is, you can understand that during the night it becomes dark, calm, pleasant. There is a there is a definitely significantly appreciable darkness, calmness and pleasantness that you can perceive in the night. This darkness and calmness and pleasantness will create a factor called tamas and that tamas factor will enable you to sleep. Even during the day when you make the room pitch dark and if it is pleasant, you will sleep off. You have a pleasant music around you, you will sleep off. So this darkness, calmness and pleasantness, which, which it will create a factor tamas, which will help you sleep, which makes you, puts you to sleep. But instead, nowadays, what is happening is we have bright screens in front of us. We have bright lights in front of us. We have bright thoughts and ideas and discussions during the time where we are supposed to sleep. When you have this opposite of darkness, calmness and pleasantness, when you have brightness around you, your sleep is disturbed. It is difficult for one to get a good sleep. So when your sleep is disturbed, doshas are disturbed. When doshas are disturbed, you are prone to disease. So we have completed aspect one. Aspect two, among the six points, the aspect two is to have a good agni. The agni is understood as a digestive fire. In Ayurveda, digestion is understood as an aspect of fire. There is a factor called digestive fire risk, which is responsible for digestion and metabolism. This is one of the important factors for health, which is an important factors of even well-being and important factors of even preventing you from disease or immunity. Agni or the digestive fire is an important factor when it comes to the concept of immunity also. How to have an optimal Agni or how to optimize Agni? What are the key points that we have to take care to maintain this Agni optimally to have best health and best 
immune system. Quantity of food plays an important role, especially during this pandemic. People have nothing to do but prepare various dishes and when you prepare your food delicacies and things like that, you tend to overeat. So quantity of food, having a good check on the quantity of food is an important thing. There are a lot of misconceptions that is going around the quantity of food. We see that there are so many explanations that, there, that is prevailing around what should be the quantity of food. But there is no explanation that is at par with the comprehensive explanation of Ayurveda's concept of the capacity or the quantity at which one person, quantity of food that one person has to consume. Uh, it is told that Ayurveda, of course, as I told you, I'm not talking in detail. Each of the topic, take sleep or you take uh, exercise, etc. Each one of this topic each one of the points that I have mentioned is a topic by itself. We can discuss about exercise for two hours. We can discuss about sleep and the pattern of sleep for two hours. We can discuss about the quantity of food for one or two hours. I'm just giving you, giving you the taste of the explanation and making you start from somewhere, I'm giving you the starting point. We have to eat half the capacity. That is half the capacity of the stomach should be dedicated for solid food. One fourth of the capacity, one fourth of the stomach is should be dedicated for liquid food. One fourth should be left free for the movement of doshas or the movement of air, etc. How to understand or how to perceive that one fourth of the capacity of the stomach is free? We cannot have a scanning machine always with us to diagnose this. It's not a diagnostic requirement. Rather, there is a concept called satisfaction. When you are satisfied, it means that your three-fourth of the stomach is full. So you have to achieve satisfaction with a liquid component in your meal. That liquid component can be even be water that you are drinking during the meal. Or if it is a watery food, that liquid component is taken care of. So you stop when you have something called satisfaction. And even after you get satisfaction, you can easily go in for another helping. That helping is going to fill up the last quadrant, which is going to disturb the digestive process. Your Agni is going to suffer. Your digestive fire is going to suffer. Now, when we talk about satisfaction, your satisfaction is not a, a genuine satisfaction if you are not connected with the food, if you are not eating food in a meditative mindset or if you are not having a mindfulness in eating. That is why our Shastra, not just Ayurveda, you would have learned all the shlokas and things, all this from the teachers of Vedanta. We pray before we eat. Brahma Arpanam, Brahma Haver, Brahma Agnav, Brahma Nahutam or we tell, Brahma, uh, uh, we tell various shlokas like uh, Aham Vaishwana Robhutva from Bhagavad Gita. Aham Vaishwana Robhutva Praninam Deha Mashrata Pranapana Samayukta Pacham Yannam Chatur Vidam. We pray this. We, if the food that we eat is kind of an offering to the Lord Himself, it's just that kind of uh, significance or importance has been given to food. Food should be taken in a meditative process. Only when we take food in, that, in such meditative mindset or when we take food with complete connection with the food, the satisfaction we achieve will be a genuine satisfaction. We would have experienced a meal with the family where we talk with friends, etc. Where we talk, eat, eat and talk and eat, etc. We will be full until the throat. People will tell, don't open your mouth. I can see the food inside your mouth. In, I can see the food in your throat. In India, we have a... a kind of a metaphorical explanation. Don't open your mouth. Crow can come and pick food from your mouth. You have eaten to that point, that way of explanation. You, you will eat until your throat, but one is not satisfied when we are socializing during the process of eating. So having a mindful process of eating, having good connection with the food to achieve an optimal satisfaction and stop there is essential. 
say one has have one has taken a, a satisfactory meal you still have left one fourth quadrant or one quadrant is left for the moment of doshas for ideal digestion say you are going to immediately drink water and fill up that last quadrant again your digestive process is disturbed nowadays with this uh, covid scenario people are are uh, behind this fruit telling that fruit is essential uh, fruit is most important for improving the immunity or boost your immunity fruits are fine but it is not mandatory uh, i am just giving you a small i'll i'll give you a link to one of the this is one of the links regarding fruits and this is one of one another link so these two links are there in the comment box about fruits and immunity you can read this link and you can get this uh, bigger picture about fruits so freshly cooked foods even bhagavad gita talks about this uh, in this wake of uh, pandemic there are two reasons where people take over nutritious food one you are the boredom creates people to eat more Uh, you have nothing to do but to eat and then people gain weight and things like that and number 2 for the sake of improving the immunity people take lot of nutritious food and supplements when you take this over nutritious food with the with a misconception that you are going to improve your immunity no you are not going to improve your immunity your immune system is going to struggle and sump because your agni the digestive fire struggles to manage this over nutritious food so don't take any over nutritious food optimum sarva dharmeshu madhyamam i'm going to talk about this sarva dharmeshu madhyamam moderation in everything ayurveda also explains about certain rules in eating do not speak while eating do not stand and eat there is even ayurveda talks about order of eating and order of serving we start the meal with a sweet for example when we start the meal with a sweet instead of ending the meal with a sweet and a dessert when you start the meal with a sweet the further quantity of meal that you can consume is controlled or you cannot eat more when you start your meal with a sweet there is no hard and fast rule that you have to start the meal with a sweet but if at all there is a meal so there is no hard and fast rule that one has to eat uh sweet every day but if at all there is a sweet if there is a dessert i'm not talking about dessert if there is any sweet dominant item if that is going to be the first thing that you eat the digestive process is going to be, be getting better and men with this just one note many a times uh, you might think that what is he bluffing what is this how can we take a dessert in the beginning no that is how ayurveda explains that is how the whole uh indian style of eating if i'm if i have time I, i as i told you this topic can be discussed for one or two hours we have that much of wealth in information when you have a proper agni or a digestive system your evacuation system will be proper so if your evacuation system is not functioning properly you can understand that the your main core aspect of your health and aspect of immunity is not functioning properly this is a marker so how to get a proper evacuation don't run behind the trifala or a laxative rather you have to see in a holistic way where these small changes can help you get better the next aspect is dhatu the structural elements of the body how can we have an optimal strength of the structural elements of the body structural elements of the body meaning the individual elements like bones and tissues and things like that to have a balanced nutrition so what is a balanced nutrition nowadays this is the million dollar doubt that everyone has what is a balanced nutrition we have gone to the extent of telling balanced nutrition is vegetable dominant meal pulse dominant meal a meal which has all three colors the meal which has what not we have all explanation what is a balanced nutrition is uh the the concept of balanced nutrition changes every 3 months that's a present fake and uh, nowadays we get lot of information like 
from WhatsApp University and Facebook University. They have become universities giving information. And uh, with this uh, pandemic and with this uh, current scenario of immunity being at stake, and this WhatsApp and Facebook universities have taken charge and you get every day new information and each of the information are self-contradictory information. So we are all puzzled with what this, what is that we have to follow. Ayurveda gives a beautiful baseline, a proven Shastra which cannot go wrong at any given time. So for the sake of balanced nutrition or for the sake of improving the immunity, many a people Many a times people take loads and loads of vitamins and supplements also. Uh, people take that seed, chia seed, linen, linen that's a lot of things people take. If you ask them, why are you taking all this? Because this is good for protein, this is good for minerals, this is good for vitamins, etc. You have a reason for everything that you take and end of the day you see you, you consume a lot of things. Uh, Improper combination and improper processing. We believe that we are taking a lot of good stuff. But even if you take a lot of good stuff, if they are not combined properly, it is not going to work good. One simple example I can give you now with this uh, in this topic is that we all know honey is good. Nowadays, people have accepted ghee so well. Ghee and honey are two wonderful substances, but ghee and honey, when mixed together in equal proportion, it is having a, such a bad it is having such a bad effect on the body. It works like poison. It is too good stuff, but when they are combined improperly, it can have a negative impact. Similarly, milk and chicken, uh, sorry, milk and fish, can have a terrible negative impact. Chicken and yogurt can have a terrible negative impact. Ayurveda has explanations about this improper combination. There is no point in telling, okay, this and this are bad. You have to understand the whole logic and reasoning behind it. As I told you, this can be a topic of discussion by itself. Improper processing. A simple mistake in the processing can have a negative result. Uh, a shocking, many of you might go in for a shock hearing this. A simple processing, hot heat and honey are terrible uh, combinations. If you make honey warm or if you heat honey, if you make honey with any substance that is hot and if you consume, it is having a poisonous effect. Poison meaning you're not going to die, but it is going to have a slow negative impact on the body. You will build up with disease and you are going to suffer. Nowadays, you are, as I told you, most of you are on a shock. What is this? Every day I'm taking hot water with honey. Where did Ayurveda talk about hot, hot water and honey? Ayurveda recommends madhu taka, honey and water. It can be even boiled water brought down to room temperature. But honey and hot water, never it has been told. But as I told you, with time, people come with their own conclusions and their own Whims and fancies comes into practice. Then that's how such practices of honey and hot water, etc. And uh, coming to non-vegetarian food. Non-vegetarian food is permissible for the sake of nutrition. But many a times what happens is non-vegetarian food is taken for the sake of gratification. You might have a doubt what Ayurveda non-vegetarian is not Ayurveda. Ayurveda, a vegetarian, Shastra, vegetarian things. No, Ayurveda is a part of Vedas, of course. But still, it is a wisdom that is available for each and every living being on earth. It is not for vegetarians. It is for each and every living being, human being on earth. So it has to be accommodative. So non-vegetarian food is also explained in Ayurveda. So the next topic is OGES. What is this OGES and what can we do to have this optimal OGES to have a good health? When someone has these three factors, the three factors that we saw is dosha, agni and datu. If these three factors function normally with the recommendations that we have already discussed, your OGES is going to be optimal. 
so what is this ojas this ojas is the essence of all the metabolism if one has a good metabolism the end result of the metabolism is a factor called ojas this ojas is nothing but a reserve energy and not this reserve energy is responsible for even optimal physiology in a crisis for example this ojas is an essence of a person the essence of digestive process essence of metabolism this ojas is acting as a reserve this reserve will come up and help you in crisis it need not be a crisis like pandemic it can be a crisis like one fine day you have to exert yourself we have seen that if you exert your vata dosha is disturbed but even when vata dosha is disturbed you don't suffer with the disturbance of vata if you have this reserve because this reserve ojas will come in four and it will help you in that particular crisis if you don't eat a meal if you don't have this reserve of ojas you get so weak you get you get really tired but when you have this ojas in reserve you don't get weak so this is a unique concept of ayurveda this ojas is many a times directly connected with or directly related with immunity ojas and immunity are highly parallel i was talking about reserve ayurveda always emphasizing about reserve capacities that is sarva dharmeshu madhyamam anuyayat pratipadam sarva dharmeshu madhyamam in all aspects of life we have to follow the moderation that is for example we saw exercise we told moderation in exercise don't do full your full of your capacity do half your capacity have some reserve we were talking about digestive process eating capacity don't full up your stomach have a reserve space for the process of digestion so there is always a concept of reserve there is always a concept of moderation that has been emphasized in ayurveda one episode of anger grief etc anger grief sorrow can burn away this ojas one episode is enough to burn away this ojas so this grief sorrow etc many a times we are worried for no reason this worry can also deplete your ojas if your ojas is depleted your immunity is depleted if your immunity is depleted you are prone for or you are susceptible for infection even covid infection so you see how this is interconnected how ayurveda interconnects these things your immune responsiveness is connected to ojas as i had told you before uh gil has come out with your thoughts on fasting for 16 hours and intake of nutrition over 8 hours 16 8 is nothing but uh if time permits i will take it during the discussion if not i will take this question during the question and answer session the concept of manas the mind so nowadays people are seemingly uh claiming that they are healthy because their papers their uh, markers their lab investigations prove that they are healthy their mri and things prove that they are healthy but a positive health is missing so what is this positive health positive health is a health where even a person is uh, healthy at the at, at the level of mind so what is that health at the level of mind so if a person is happy for no reason you are healthy at the level of mind this is the requirement or this is the reason or i would say this is the benchmark of positive health being happy for no reason nowadays we want some food to be happy we want to go for a ride a drive to be healthy we want to watch tv to be sorry we want some reasons to be happy we want to go for a long drive to be happy we want to watch a film to be happy we want to watch television to be happy so we are always looking for a external factor to be happy but a real happiness at the level of mind is being happy for no reason and of course vedanta is 
the only solution or the only solution of course yoga and meditation can also pitch in but vedanta explains even ayurveda directs you to vedanta ayurveda directs a person to vedanta for attaining this state of happiness previously people were talking about psychosomatic diseases and i they were praising ayurveda for psychosomatic diseases we were telling that no ayurveda is one step ahead of psychosomatic diseases ayurveda talks about mind and vata pitta kapha and mind and vata pitta kapha is one step further to psychosomatic diseases that is a connection between body and mind and nowadays the modern researchers have come out with a concept called psycho neuro endocrino immunology which is parallel with an understanding of mind vata pitta kapha psycho the mind neuro vata endocrine system the pitta the immunological system the kapha so the modern researches are evolving and it is coming closer and closer to ayurveda even this concept of 16 is to 8 fasting is coming closer to ayurveda deha bala is the strength of the body it is the cumulative effects of all the above factors that we have seen is responsible for deha bala is the strength of the body is the strength or the immune system of the body the barrier mechanisms of the body thereby all the physical barriers are working perfect the physical barriers for example when we are going and when we are in the middle of uh, when we are exposing ourselves to this infection or uh, we are exposed we are getting closer to the person who's already infected we have lot of barrier mechanisms which prevent the infection going inside the body so that barrier mechanisms works perfect if the cumulative strength of the body is good exercise is one of the important factors which is responsible for a good deha bala when it comes to exercise as i told you moderation is a most important factor seasonal influence is also a factor that we have to understand when it comes to exercise not just for exercise for all aspects uh, the general bala of a person the general strength of the person as i started in the beginning is excellent during winter the strength of the person gets weaker when it comes to spring it becomes worse during summer and rainy season so we have to understand those aspects also and our exercise also should be according our exercise should be minimal minimal bare minimal in summer and rainy season exercise can be very good very good meaning half your capacity during winters and even in spring season so to prevent the entry of virus what are the things that ayurveda recommends these are some take home information based on some researches happening as you know the maximum number of researches are happening in this last 3 or 4 months i would say even in ayurveda i would say you all know that the virus we gets active only when it gets it gets entry into our body the virus is inactive when it is there outside but only when it gets entry into our body it gets active so nasal passage and mouth are the most important entry points we all know that we are all phd in covid 19 by now with whatsapp university and the facebook university and the virus multiplies in the nasal epithelium you would all have understood it so even modern researchers have come to a conclusion that drug administered through intra nasal route is highly effective and nasya and gandusha are two important ayurveda practices which can help very well in preventing the entry of the virus i would say nasya and gandusha can act as short vaccines short acting vaccines it can act as vaccines for 3 or 4 hours i would say that effective it would be so what is nasya it is an application of oil into the nostrils i am not going into the detailed procedure the way i would suggest you is oil pulling with sesame oil yes that is going to be the gandusha is nothing but oil pulling i am going to talk about it that was a doubt i am going to talk about that take some coconut oil coconut oil and sesame oil are both are used but in this coconut oil has been uh, researched and 
and it is being concluded that coconut oil has an antiviral effect so because of reason because of this reason the ministry of ayush the ministry of health and ministry of ayush in india have promoted coconut oil for this taking some little coconut oil in your little finger applying it inside both the nostrils that is more than enough doing it frequently especially when you go out for some reason when you are about to meet some people this can act as short vaccines i uh, maybe it might be a tall claim but i i am just explaining the efficacy of it gandusha is nothing but the oil pulling this oil pulling has been uh, extracted from the concept of gandusha sesame oil more than sesame oil coconut oil is good at this point of time because of the antiviral activity of the proven antiviral activity of coconut oil oral wash and mouth wash made with neem licorice turmeric etc these these substances can be boiled and we can use this as oral wash and mouth wash the both of na uh, sorry oral wash and nasal wash i would not prefer suggesting combinations of medicines to take internally fumigation is one another thing ayurveda explains it as dhupana many of you would know that we use lot of resins we use the resins like gugulu from a from a plant origin uh, from a uh, herb called uh, comifora mukul there are lot of resins that we use to do fumigation and there are certain combinations ayurveda combinations like aparajita dhuma dupa dashanga dupa which are even available in amazon nowadays so using this have uh, doing a fumigation in our rooms have uh, amazing effects there are researches going on these aspects also because the, to have sterilization etc is now being discussed a lot so if someone is willing to have a herb or a medicine for immunity i would definitely suggest you to consult a physician that's not an idea and uh, as i told you each point gandusha gandusha is nothing but oil pulling oil pulling having some small quantity of oil in your mouth and rinsing or or swishing it thoroughly not gargling but swishing the mouth that is gandusha uh, this is to the doubt of ms diana so each point that we had discussed may be sleeping or may be one of the remedies i told quantity of food order of eating each one is a topic by itself so this short duration i cannot explain those topics but as we as we had discussed with ramji we can have we can plan some webinars on each topic exclusively for example uh, maybe we can take uh, exercise as a topic and we can bring in all aspects of ayurveda Or, or, or all aspects of exercise as explained in ayurveda shastra so one can customize ayurveda is all about customization so one can customize one if one understands the topic well so the concept of customization would be possible when you understand the bigger picture so we can take a topic and we can plan to arrive we can we can certainly at, arrive at a bigger picture so neti question regarding the neti question someone is asking if we can uh, boil the water with turmeric and then when it is cooled down can we use it in the neti pot i told the answer is yes and there was a person who had asked about this 16 is to 8 ayurveda basically talks about two meal a day that is uh just taking two meals so if you uh, actually see the placing of the two meals it would almost fit into the concept of 16 is to 8 or an intermittent fasting but is it a standard advice that everyone can do intermittent fasting at all time i would say the answer is no because when you see the explanation of seasons when you get into the concept of winters ayurveda tells that bhratareva bubukshitam a person uh, the digestive capability of a person is strong during winters 
when the digestive capability of a person is strong a person is hungry early in the morning pratareva bubukshitam you are hungry very early in the morning which calls for something called breakfast so that is a reason we see in cold weathers people have a tendency to have an early breakfast and many a times we see the breakfast is sweet dominant in nature early breakfast sweet dominant nature so in a cold weather if a person's digestive fire is excellent if a person is uh, taking this two meal a day with ex- with very good hunger in a winter the the explanation of ayurveda is that you are going to destroy your your uh, the the what do you call dhatu or to put it in i don't get a good english word to tell that dhatu paka is something that happens dhatu paka is nothing but a phenomenon that happens in the late stage of diabetes where people lose their body musculature and things like that there is a kind of a destructive mechanism happening at the level of muscles and body so one will be susceptible to have that kind of dhatu paka or destructive mechanism going around if one is not keeping up with appropriate nourishment especially in winters especially when the digestive power of a person is excellent so which brings us to a standpoint or logical standpoint that if someone is willing to do some dieting in winters it's a very bad idea it's a it's a real bad idea so when to do what to do nature tells us so clearly so precisely the the problem is that we have lost connection with nature so we don't hear the whispers of nature our forefathers were clearly hearing the whispers of nature and following ayurveda wherever they were your forefathers even if you are from england or if you are from usa or uk wherever you are from your forefathers had followed ayurveda to the t because they were hearing the whispers of nature we have gone very far from nature so we don't hear the whispers and so we need some uh, directions and that directions are beautifully available structured concrete clear precise directions are available in ayurveda the problem is that either they are diluted in the in the interest of making the information easy ayurveda is diluted or it's mixed up it's mixed up and messed up so we can definitely find an optimal point undiluted authentic ayurveda can be brought out to the public and that has been our mission for the last 12 years so there are a few more questions yes so there's there's a there's a question here that says first of all if i have to teach yoga at 7:30 in the evening and you're saying yeah. that exercise is 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 bad and is better in the yeah. morning than the evening how can i how can i adjust for it exactly so this is a beautiful question which takes me to the explanation of yoga also i bring in yoga here yoga chitta vritti nirodha let's not talk about that let's if you take asana sthiram sukham asanam the posture in which a person is sthira stable and sukha comfortable so you take a posture where you are so stable and so comfortable whereas when you see the definition of exercise sharira ayasa jananam karma vyayama muchyate that is a activity which brings in tiredness to the body so they are totally different if one is doing yoga asana and if one is feeling tired or one feels that one is exhausted and sweating with yoga asana you have not done an asana as explained by yoga shastra it is not sthiram it is not sukham rather it should be called as vyayama if one is doing an exercise like vyayama or uh, if one is doing asana like vyayama there is no other option you have to do it in the morning but if one is doing a real ayur yoga asana in real sense sthiram sukham asanam 
one like the krishnamacharya tradition of yoga a relaxed simple slow thing you have a provision to do you have a freedom to do at any point of time there is no restriction so you have to understand the difference between the sthiram sukham aspect of yoga and the sharira ayasa janana aspect of exercise so that makes the difference i hope that made it clear Oh, that's lovely. Thank you. And there was another question that's saying, you you talked about that between the seasons, one has to be very careful in the transition. What? Yeah. So we're going to go from summer to autumn here. What we yeah. should be mindful of as we transition from summer to autumn. Uh, let me see if I can pull out a. Is my screen visible? Yes, we can see your screen. Uh, this becomes a little technical. When you go from summer to autumn, I understand that uh, summer is grishma, and uh, I, I believe uh, summer and rainy season is clubbed here. When you move from this summer to autumn season, basically what happens is the body would have been in a bad shape during summer and rainy season. this digestive power what you see in sharath what you see here in autumn on the left people can see there is a mild improvement in the digestive system so the provision to slightly you were supposed to you are expected to have a highly restricted diet habit now if you are not having a highly restricted diet habit if you are not having small but nourishing meals if you are not having fruits etc at this point of time you are already in trouble so from this season when you jump into autumn season or when you transit to the autumn season basically the digestive capability slowly increases one important thing that we see in sharat ritu or the uh, the autumn season is that the nature gives lot of creepers the climbers and creepers the vegetables from the climbers and creepers like bitter gourd ridge gourd bottle gourd etc that will be available in plenty i am not sure about the status in uk but you will see nature is giving you lot of uh, amla fruit or lot of substances that has little bitter and astringent taste so bitter and astringent taste is something that is very essential at this at this autumn season and the disturbance if you see there is a disturbance of pitta the pitta factor is undergoing a terrible increase the pitta factor will undergo terrible increase so we have to be cautious about spicy food the spicy food has to be reduced and there should be an incorporation of ghee at this period moderate amount of ghee ghee is not possible to be taken in winter in this uh, summer and rainy season because the digestive system would have been very weak with the digestive system slowly improving and the next season is going to be an amazing season winter winter is going to be improving your digestive capability like anything and you can bring in all your delicacies and all your wish list in your food can be brought out in winter but this is the transition between winter so ghee can be gradually added things that are bitter in taste and astringent in taste especially bitter food naturally the bitter food there is a bitterness in all the climbers and creepers including them in the diet will be a very essential thing at this point however if we again understanding ritucharya the season is a topic by itself we need 3 to 4 hours to discuss about this to get a bigger picture of this well, that's very that's very helpful thank you very much there's somebody who did ask that they're very interested in uh, studying ayurveda but they want to study it in english are there any schools that good school uh-huh. that that teach in english if Or you is- are willing to study ayurveda for maintaining your health or if you are willing to learn ayurveda not the con- not the philosophy and fundamental principles of ayurveda but the concepts of ayurveda to have a healthy living 
that is possible with english in the sense uh, not with english books but a teacher or a person who translates the shastra in english but if someone is willing to study ayurveda for the sake of learning the shastra it is impossible to study it in english you don't get the essence of it the language is the first thing if you are willing to study ayurveda in a proper way there are schools which teach in english but it is not possible is my it's a blunt statement i would bluntly tell that you will not understand ayurveda properly if you are studying it in english though it's a blunt statement that's a truth that's great thank you very much and then somebody else says especially in the in the western world is so very difficult to wake up first thing in the morning certainly before 5 am or something have you got some ideas other than just going to sleep early any other practices that can help us in waking us up in the morning um again the the aspect of mind is the only thing if you have decided to wake up early if you have a pratigna if you, if you have decided that at least for the next two months i am going to wake up at this particular time i'm not going to snooze my alarm for any reason or leave th- third uh, 60 days take 30 days 30 days i am going to get up at this particular time come what may i am going to do this if you are going to have that kind of a pratigna if you are going to sleep early and wake up at this particular time and 31st day you will be up 2 minutes before your alarm there is no doubt about it there is no doubt about it and that becomes your practice that becomes your habit when it becomes your habit and when you enjoy that brahma muhurta when you enjoy that pleasantness of brahma muhurta and benefit of brahma muhurta you will not get back to the old habit so that is one and having a good amount of uh, water in the middle of the night or uh, not good amount of water reasonable amount of water in the middle of the night or while you go to bed will not allow you to be on bed it will push you to the washroom for urination at least in the washroom <laughs> decide that you are not going to the bed again so that can be one of the uh, what you call practical tool i would say no very useful very useful Right, we've taken a huge amount of your time, um, and it's been a, a wonderful introduction. Thank you very much uh, for coming in and sharing your time and wisdom. Um, we, Charlie and I, appreciated how much you know the very first moment that we met you, and it's been wonderful to be able to share that with uh, our other people. So you've had some wonderful thank yous that have come in through the chat line, and I think there has been. Um, Uh, there is a demand to know more of some of these detailed subjects and uh, we will work with you okay. and try and get some of these things done in sort of short courses so that we can get yeah. this information imparted as best as we can but, but wonderful it nice remains to say thank you very much indeed as always for your support for your dedication for your wisdom really appreciate it thank you very much everyone who registered you, and came on board it's been lovely to have you with us and uh, so it's now gone nine o'clock in the evening we wish you a good evening dr patna sharathi ji yeah. thank you so much thank good you. wishes you. to your family stay well thank everyone you. thank you very much indeed and um, i mean if you want to finish with a prayer then you may do yeah. so that would be a good way to complete everything yeah ಪೂರ್ಣಮದ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಿ ಪೂರ್ಣಾತ್ ಪೂರ್ಣಮುದಚ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಸ್ಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮಾದಾಯ ಪೂರ್ಣಮೇವಶಿಷ್ಯ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಹರಿ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುಭ್ಯೋ ನಮಃ ಹರಿ ಓಂ